Dean Smith built a basketball kingdom in his own image. He served as an example that you could do it the right way and compete for a national championship. But before the championships and the national respect, Smith endured a gauntlet of public derision. I would say, and the head coach of the Tar Heels, Dean Smith, and he'd get booed. We could see this effigy hanging from the tree with the name of Coach Smith on it. Such dark events didn't alter Smith's instincts to take care of his players, no matter the circumstance. And the fact that I was able to get the disease under control with him behind me uh, probably saved my life. Somehow, Dean Smith would always pull a, a rabbit on his hat last minute and cost us the game. He's almost like a mad scientist. Uh, I think you know, in, in a lot of areas, Coach Smith was ahead of the game. Use of timeouts comes to mind right away. Nobody could extend the game longer and make two minutes feel like two hours. The impact of Dean Smith's brilliance as a tactician and motivator was felt by everyone in North Carolina's Carmichael Auditorium on March 2nd, 1974. 86 78 with 17 seconds left to play. Duke is leading by eight. We had a timeout, and Coach Smith said, This is great, isn't it? You know, we're going to win this game, and here's how we're going to do it. I'm looking up at this clock and the score and everything, and I think the guy's crazy. Bobby Jones is at the free throw line, and he just categorically stated, Bobby's going to make these two free throws, and we're going to go into a certain defensive set. It is 86 to 80. Fly should have made the inbound play, bounce it in, recovered by Walter Davis underneath the Cuser. Layup is good by Cuser. Tarheel's get a timeout, stopping the clock with 13 seconds left to play in the ball game. So hold everything. Another timeout, and he's saying, okay, now what we're going to do, we're going to steal the ball. If we don't steal it, we've got a foul. Knocked away off Armstrong. Carolina control. No time. He left off the clock. Walter Davis inbounds the ball to stall. Back to Davis. Jump shot behind the glass. Will not go. They battle for it inside. Jones has got it. Put it up to Jones. Timeout. Timeout taken. It's 86 to 84. Carolina has stopped the clock with six seconds left to play. We didn't get the pass, and we, we fouled right away. Four seconds to go. Sure enough, the best free throw shooter missed the free throw. It was a one and one, and that would have put the game away. Foul is set to rebound. Carolina gets time out with three seconds left to play in the game. Kupchak will make the long front court pass. Gets it to Walter Davis. Two, one. Walter takes the shot. <laughs> After that game, I was just convinced that he was the smartest man I'd ever been around. And he was so relaxed and so confident that I think that carries over to the players. He was very innovative. They had what they call four corners. And if you were playing against them, you just dreaded that time. They're in their famous four-corner offense. A man in each corner and Phil Ford in the middle. They stretched the floor. They would just melt the clock and all of a sudden be occasionally sneak in and take a layup because everybody was spread out to the corners, but it was to control the game. The last score of this game was over five minutes ago. Come on, pick up the tempo. Let's go. Let's go. Coaches in college basketball abhorred the four corners, abhorred the slowdown game. Bill Foss used to say, I thought Naismith invented basketball and not Dean Smith. It revolutionized basketball because it forced basketball to put in the shot clock. He originated the idea of the huddle at the foul line. Acknowledgement of a good pass by pointing uh, some of his zone traps. I can't think of anybody that brought more new ideas to the game than Dean. I'm not so sure he ever slept, because I think he must have spent his whole life just studying basketball and all the nuances. I remember walking in that gym on a Saturday night, and there was Coach Smith, in the middle of the summer, looking at film by himself late at night. And I said, Coach, there's not a college basketball coach in the country doing what you're doing tonight. And if there's any justice in this world, you're going to succeed, and I believe succeed big time. That deep personal investment paid huge dividends. In his 36-year reign as their head coach, the Tar Heels captured two national championships and produced at least 20 victories in 27 straight campaigns. 
He retired with 879 wins, more than any college coach before him. It truly is a program that came out of who he was from inside himself, um, his heart and his soul and his belief system. He wanted to separate Carolina from everybody else. And, and he did that through a number of different ways, including how they traveled, how they dressed, how they behaved. Nothing happened in his basketball program from on the court, from advertising to off the court to image control that didn't have his finger in. Growing up, he was a catcher in baseball. That person controls the baseball and the pitching. He was a quarterback in football. He was a point guard in basketball. So all the various sports, the positions he played, he was in control. When we had practice, we knew from 3 to 3.15 we did this, from 3.15 to 3.30 we did it. Every single minute was outlined. Every single minute had a purpose. Punctuality was very important to him. You may not believe this, my watch is 10 minutes fast right now, and it's been that way since I was 18 years old, my freshman year in North Carolina. And I call it DES time, Dean Edward Smith time. We won a discipline team, and I was kind of a dictator. I hope a, you could say maybe a nice dictator sometimes. Hold it, Larry! Journal, you're talking and I'm talking. Which one does that happen? Wake up! You know, he never cursed. But he could get on you when you feel like he used every full letter word possible. I remember walking home from practice with my teammates and asking them, did he call us SOBs today? And we'd all laugh because, you know, we all knew better. If you have a bad play, he would take that little clicker and just re reverse the film three or four times and you would see your mistake. And he wouldn't say anything, he would just click it back and forth. And, you know, you'd get the point. He'd tell you exactly what you did wrong and what you had to do right. That's what players want to hear. They don't want to hear suck it up or be a man. That's not telling me how to stop a player. Play together, play hard, play smart were the drum beats of a complex teaching repertoire meant to inspire harmony on the court. Dean always knew how to use his best players the best way while still incorporating a team concept. He made sure that the other people had a sense that they were equally important. You remember the joke, uh, who could hold Michael Jordan under 20, Dean Smith? Well. That's a tribute to coaching because he got Worthy and, and Jordan and all of those great talents to play team ball first. I came out of the game and Coach Smith said, those three or four tough shots you took there. I said, well, Coach, I was feeling it. And he said, go ahead and feel the backs. <laughs> there were times when I felt Smith's teams so subjugated individual talent that they could not perform to the maximum. They had the players to do it, but I felt they didn't always do it because of Dean's control. Kenny Anderson was the ultimate creative playmaker slash scorer, and North Carolina was one of the schools that recruited him hard, and one of the things he said was, I just don't want to go become another horse in Dean Smith's stable. He was a person who taught people to think, and in the process of teaching them to think and teaching them how to play, you can't allow so many freedoms. If you want freedom, you don't go to school. We did make a lot of decisions on players as to whether or not they would accept that philosophy of sharing the basketball and would accept the philosophy of uh, being a student athlete. I think you have to have a foundation, and the foundation at Carolina was this thing that we came to call the system. That one really bothered me when somebody called we had a system, IBM of college basketball. You know, we had a way we'd like to play, but would change year to year with our personnel. Some people thought he had to be in control of everything. Well, I looked at it more as a guy protecting something that he had built, but protecting it in the name of the young men who had made the program, instead of protecting it for anything the coach would want to get out of it. He was a gym rat. He went to practice, watched his father's team's practice. I really believe he knew that he was going to coach from the time he was uh, 10 or 11 years old. Born in Emporia, Kansas on February 28, 1931 to Alfred and Vesta Smith, 
Dean, the younger of two children, learned early and well the way of the righteous. Both of his parents were school teachers. His father was a teacher and a coach. The academics came first. His mother absolutely saw to that. I think it's extremely important to him to do things the right way, and I think a lot of it had to do with his parents. It was important to them that we all go to church, which we did three times a day on Sunday, and Mother was the church organist and Dad was the chief usher. It was understood that we did not smoke, we did not drink, we did not curse, we did not lie. <laughs> When Smith was 14, tragedy visited his idyllic world. It came in the summer of 1945, striking a friend, Shad Woodruff, with whom he had played American Legion baseball over the 4th of July weekend. A couple, three days later, why Shad Woodruff was dead with the bull bar polio. And Dean had a bunch of clippings and, and things of that nature, and he made a scrapbook and uh, took it over and, and gave it to uh, Shad's uh, parents. It was just... Uh... A traumatic experience for me and uh, stay in touch with us for years and years with the family. Dean learned the virtues of loyalty, compassion, and justice from his parents. As a football, basketball, and track coach at Emporia High School, Alfred Smith further instilled in his son the principle of fair play and what would become a consuming drive to win through organization and strategy. I do up uh, double wing play for him. He acted like, gee, that's a good idea, Dean. When we'd play on the sand lot, why, he'd have a lot of plays that we got together on, and he'd, he'd tell us to do things. Then, if we had a problem, we'd go home to his dad, and he'd ask his dad, now, what do you do in, in situations like this? He was a gym rat. He went to practice, watched his father's team's practice, uh, travel on the road with him to games when he could. I really believe he knew that he was going to coach from the time he was uh, 10 or 11 years old. After Smith played ninth grade football and basketball under his father in Emporia, the family moved to Topeka the next summer. Six years later, as a junior at Kansas, Smith was a reserve guard when legendary coach Fogg Allen and his assistant, Dick Harp, led the Jayhawks to the 1952 NCAA championship. At the start of the game, the starters would go in, and then uh, Dean would usually be about the other end of the bench, which kind of reflected how quick he was going to get in the game. It wouldn't be very long in the game until Dean was no longer at the other end of the bench. He would be sitting next to Dick Harp uh, and Dr. Allen and, and pointing out things that were going on in, in the game. Dean used to uh, actually coach uh, the second, third team running the same type of plays. After graduation in 1953, Smith served briefly as a graduate assistant at Kansas before fulfilling his ROTC obligation in the Air Force. While stationed in Germany, he met Bob Speer, who hired Smith as an assistant when he became head coach at the newly opened Air Force Academy in 1955. Coach Speer was a hero of sorts to Coach Smith. He saw Coach Speer go against teams with much better talent. Uh, than Air Force Academy had and still figure out ways to win the game. On the day of the 1957 NCAA final between North Carolina and Kansas, Spear introduced Smith to the Tar Heels coach. With the possibility of a job in the air, Smith impressed Frank McGuire, who posed him a question. McGuire says to young Dean Smith, so Dean, who are you going to be pulling for tonight? And Dean Smith swallowed hard and said, I'm going to have to go with the old alma mater coach and then left the hotel room and went to call his dad and said, I think I just blew it with Coach McGuire. And Alfred Smith said, no, no, he'll admire and respect your honesty. And that's really the way it turned out. It bedrocked the relationship between Dean and Frank McGuire. And sure enough, McGuire did hire him. If they wanted to get rid of me, I thought I could always uh, coach high school and math, but I didn't think I was going to get fired. We win on Carolina win the championship, 54 to 53. The undefeated 1957 championship season immortalized Frank McGuire, not only at North Carolina, but throughout the college basketball world. Beginning in 1958, Dean Smith worked in the flamboyant New Yorker's shadow, ever diligent, ever reserved. I can remember being in a pregame meeting where Coach Smith came up with a 
game plan, and Coach McGuire came in and uttered a profanity, which was his nature, and said, we're not going to do that. Coach Smith was much more the tactician, and Coach McGuire was much more the emotional, instinct-oriented coach. In January of 1961, during Smith's third season under McGuire, the Tar Heel basketball program was placed on a year's probation for excessive recruiting expenditures. Seven months later, McGuire resigned to become the head coach of the Philadelphia Warriors. The chancellor, Bill Acock, wanted Dean to be his head basketball coach. He says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to give this university a basketball team that it can be proud of. Coach McGuire was a giant when Coach Smith was hired to take his place. To many people, he was a midget. And no one, I think, in their wildest dreams thought this fellow would be, in time, bigger than Frank McGuire. At 30, Smith began the 1961-62 season as North Carolina's head coach. Working under tight university restrictions, his team finished at eight and nine. Although it would be Smith's single losing campaign as a head coach, it was just the beginning of a four-year siege on campus. It was the worst. We lost scholarships. We were only allowed to play 16 regular season games. Um, he had every obstacle you could possibly have in front of him. And I thought seriously about leaving. I was doing the PA for the games played in the Greensboro Coliseum. And at the end of the Carolina introductions, I would say, and the head coach of the Tar Heels, Dean Smith, and he'd get booed. The fans' discontent grew stronger in his third season as the Tar Heels finished fifth in the ACC, while rival Duke reached the final four for the second straight year. The next season, following a 22-point loss to Wake Forest in January of 1965, Smith felt the full measure of the students' wrath. We pulled up to Woolen Gym. It was about 11, 11.30 that night, and uh, we could see some students gathered around over on the front of Woolen Gym, and then as we got off the bus, we could see this effigy hanging from the tree and uh, with the name of Coach Smith on it. And the minute Billy Cunningham saw this, he moved out ahead of everybody, went over there and yanked that down. If they wanted to get rid of me, I thought I could always uh, coach high school and uh, math, but I didn't think I was going to get fired. The fact that he was hung in effigy and the fact that the team had that terrible loss did cause him to rethink. He told me, maybe I'm not supposed to be a coach. Maybe I'm supposed to be doing something else. At a low point in Smith's personal crucible, he read Beyond Ourselves, given him by his sister. He was particularly moved by one chapter. That power of helplessness is very strong. Just the fact that, uh, you know, you kind of turn everything over to uh, our creator and, you know, do what you can and don't worry about it. And it's very helpful to me. The key piece of that was you're not master of the universe and you need to give things up and relax and you're not in charge of everything. And he said that that was a real turning point for him, that if you do the right things, winning will come. He goes to Duke with players not nearly as good as Duke had, beat Duke. The same people that hung him in effigy were hollering for him to make a speech. And Coach got up on the platform and says, I can't speak. There's something, there was something tied around my neck the other night. I just can't get the words out. Despite another effigy hung in his honor after a loss in North Carolina State, Smith finished the regular season with seven straight wins as the Tar Heels tied for second in the ACC. It was almost dawn, and help was on the way. Getting Larry Miller and Bobby Lewis, you know, those two kids were huge because everybody in the country wanted them. When he finally got the players to run the kind of basketball system that he wanted to run, then his program took the quantum leap. Smith, the Atlantic Coast Conference Coach of the Year, and third in the nation in that voting, cuts down the net with his assistants and the players. From 1967 to 1969, Smith's Tar Heels won three straight ACC regular season and tournament titles and advanced to three Final Fours. Following an 18-9 record in 1970, Smith had to prove that it was more than just excellent players that had been responsible for North Carolina's success. That season defined Coach Smith 
that 1970-71 team wasn't predicted to do anything. We didn't have a superstar on the team, and we bought into coach system. You know, play it my way, guys. Do it as a team, and you will win. The Tar Heels have won the regular season championship, and where's everybody that picked up to finish seventh? The fact that Dean was so different from Frank McGuire, once he became successful, that helped him. He was his own man. McGuire was the, the bright light. Dean was the steady candle, always burning. Smith returned to the Final Four in 1972, but even as his career was taking flight, his marriage to Ann Clevenger was in steep decline. The couple, who had three children, divorced in 1973. The one time that I had seen Dad very sad and very tearful was when he told us that he, that he and Mom were not going to be living together anymore. He felt like a failure and he felt great deal of pain because he knew that it was a shock for all of us he was there for me even during then he would listen and hear me out he was willing to take the anger as well as the love at the same time when he was going through the trauma of going through a divorce the job really kind of saved his sanity that he could get wrapped up in in his team which he certainly did in 1976, Smith married Linnea Weblamo, and the couple had two daughters, Kristen and Kelly. In time, the pain and guilt of Smith's divorce gave way to a new family dynamic. It's nice about it where my first wife, Ann, we go to her house Thanksgiving, the kids do, and my wife, uh, Linnea, you know, it's uh, something that, uh, you know, they accept, I think, very well. The journey of his life, I think, has been learning the lesson that you can't control everything. One of the great pleasures of looking at the sweep of his professional and personal lives is to see how he worked it out. He realized that failure is not the final answer, that you can look at failure, learn from failure, and keep on moving on in life. At certain points in big games especially, you could see, you know, true intensity and a passion to win. We played board games as little kids, and he didn't let us win. I mean, you know, how some parents let their kids win the games. We did not get to win. If he won fair and square, he won fair and square. At certain points in big games especially, you could see, you know, true intensity and a passion to win. The public Smith was a gentleman, the competitive Smith that rival coaches saw all the time was a no holes barred, uh, fierce, determined uh, man with a cutting tongue that would yell at the referees just as much as everybody else. There was at the time at Cameron that uh, Dean got so incensed about a sub that he went to the table, slammed his hand down on the scores table, hit the scoreboard control and put 20 points on the board. In 1977, he stormed onto the court against Kentucky in the East Final when he thought Rick Roby was roughing up one of his players. When people were playing a style of basketball that he thought was not only not good for the game, but potentially injurious to his players, that's when you saw him lose his cool. Dean it was not warm and fuzzy at all. He knew his job, and it was a them against us. I mean, he wasn't out to win any popularity contest. Norm Sloan at NC State refused to shake Dean's hand even at the coaches' meetings. He got to, to be so irritated because Dean would find your button and he would push it. He always had the ability of almost giving you a compliment. And then as you just about tasted it and began to swallow it, he'd pull it back. <laughs> he wouldn't let you savor it. He was always battling between being this incredibly competitive person and this person who wanted to be the embodiment of his spiritual beliefs. And sometimes it came out in slightly contorted ways. <laughs> we kind of burst into Dean's office and we had caught him smoking a cigarette. And Dean practically, you know, you know, burned his finger trying to put out the cigarette. Obviously it was someone concerned with his self-image. But it was also someone who legitimately did not want to spread the message, even in the state of North Carolina, that smoking tobacco is, uh, is okay. 
I think he views himself as somebody who has a social responsibility and he, the Lord put him in a position of influence and, and he felt like that was his calling to say and do what was important at the time. One of the remarkable things about Dean is his willingness to take a stand on controversial issues. Everything from being against the death penalty to supporting the nuclear freeze to welcoming and affirming gay and lesbian uh, participation at all levels in our church. Most guys in coaching feel like that's not my arena. A lot of times I didn't agree with them, but I thought, wow, I mean, that's, that's special that you step out there and, and take stands like that. As a young coach during the Civil Rights Movement, Dean Smith joined forces with his pastor from the progressive Binkley Baptist Church to help integrate Chapel Hill. The town was rigidly segregated in terms of public facilities, and Dean was willing to go with me and with an African-American student to what was then the Pines Restaurant. And uh, when they saw Dean at the door with an African-American student, there was a, an initial hesitation but they realized that there was no way they could say no to him. Coach Smith was still not uh, considered a winning coach at that time. That showed a fair amount of courage and certainly um, engendered a great deal of admiration for people for his willingness to take a chance at that point in his career to step out for fairness. Smith's social consciousness stemmed from his upbringing. In 1934, when Kansas high school basketball teams were strictly segregated, his father brought a black player onto his all-white team. The High School Athletic Association wanted Alfred Smith to drop Paul Terry from the team. And Alfred Smith refused, said, you'll have to fire me. And the, the Athletic Association backed off, and Paul Terry remained a player and a prominent player on his team. In his value system, Everybody was equal before God. To keep a young man from playing ball because of his color, Dad just felt that was totally unfair. That episode influenced Dean Smith and, and led to his goal when he got to be the head coach at Carolina was to integrate the Carolina program. In 1966, Smith found a player who qualified academically, athletically, and temperamentally to become his school's first African-American scholarship athlete, Charles Scott. Coach Smith always wanted to make me feel like I wasn't black. Coach Smith always gave me the feeling that I was like everyone else, equally appreciated as everyone else. He said, you know, I know I'm going to get a lot of opposition, et cetera, and so on. But he said, this is so long overdue and just so wrong. And I mean, he felt really emotional about it. As they went to other campuses, Coach Smith was ridiculed and Charlie Scott were ridiculed, but they stood together as a team. On the road at South Carolina, a fan yelled at Charlie. He called him a big black baboon. And Dean Smith actually wanted to go up in the stands and get this guy until he was restrained by his assistant coaches and players. This was not just something he was doing to make his basketball team better. This was the philosophy that he believed in in life. Smith always resented the fact that people didn't think he would, was a great coach until he won a national championship. Dean Smith, a values-driven coach and man, saw even larger goals than just winning games. He wanted to establish relationships with players that were sustained not only in the short term, but in the long term. We never, ever talked about winning in North Carolina. You know, it was very important to win. The only time I heard Coach Smith talk about winning was in the 76 Olympics. Although Dean Smith's U.S. team won Olympic gold, his Tar Heels had yet to win a national championship. Then, in 1977, Smith's troops, although hampered by injuries, won 15 straight to advance to the final against Marquette. There's Davis. He has it. Game five, 23 all. After coming back from a 12-point halftime deficit, Smith went to the four-corner strategy with the game tied. On the floor, in place of freshman star Michael Corrin, was reserve senior Bruce Buckley. 
and one of the assistants suggested, Coach, don't you think we ought to call a timeout to get Michael Corey in the game who was waiting at the scorer's table? And Coach Smith leaned over and told the assistant coach, I would never, ever do something like that to embarrass one of my players. And it comes down to one of my close friends, Bruce Buckley, uh, was in the game and went back door and got the shot blocked. What it is? And maybe had it been Michael Bourne, he would have maybe dunked the ball. There were 4,000 other examples where it worked out, and everybody remembers this one. And Marquette has won the national championship. It was the most emotional loss that I think I've ever experienced in all the years that I've been with Carolina, because you thought, this is finally it. He's finally going to win a national championship. He took an awful lot of heat because at that time, everybody said, he can't win the big one. In each of the next three seasons, Smith's Tar Heels were eliminated in the first round of the NCAA tournament. Then, in 1981, North Carolina's hopes ran high when it reached its sixth Final Four in 15 seasons. But after beating third-ranked Virginia and Ralph Sampson, the Tar Heels met Bob Knight's Hoosiers, whose point guard was not to be denied. Thomas inside, yes, sir! We felt that that one really hurt and couldn't get that monkey off his back, so the gorilla started growing and growing. It bothered me more than it should have, and I think it was just a wish to be able to silence that criticism because it seemed to overshadow some of the other accomplishments. It just got to the point where it was sickening, and as a consequence, we made a decision to, to, to do everything we could to win the national championship. Throughout the 1982 season, the team led by James Worthy, Sam Perkins, and a freshman guard named Michael Jordan had but one mission, to lift the final burden of criticism from their coach's shoulders. There were games uh, where they were just breathtaking. Here comes Jordan Unruh, Jordan. Here comes Worthy, Worthy won't take it in. James Worthy, after they won the NCAA Eastern Championship in Raleigh, he wouldn't let his teammates cut the nets down. Leave those nets there. Those are not the ones we want. We want the ones in New Orleans next week. After dispatching Houston in the semifinals, North Carolina again made the final. Down by a point to Georgetown with 32 seconds left, Smith called a timeout. Coach Smith said, we're in great shape. We're exactly where we want to be. We're going to determine who wins this game. Michael walked out. I said, if it comes to you, knock it in. And I don't even know whether you heard me, but it, he sure did. 20 seconds to go. They Jimmy Black across Oregon. Out. Here's Jordan. Yep, he's letting it go. Good from 15 feet. And it is now 63-62. Fred Brown looking. Oh, way to Worthy. Worthy five. The Tar Heels are going to win the national championship. I never will forget the expression that he had on his face, and I never will forget the fact that rather than rejoice, he walked directly to me and he embraced me. After we won and you go up to the podium, they hand you a watch. We had four managers on the team, and one did not get a watch. And back in the locker room, Coach Smith gave his watch to, to David Hart and said, here, you didn't get a watch, you should take this. The fact that he would think of that at that moment, that says something about the man for sure. Coach Smith stood before the press after that game and people were saying, how relieved are you to win your first national championship? And he said, I'm not a better coach today than I was yesterday. The Tar Heels would go nine more years before returning to the Final Four. A new force had developed in the ACC. Eight miles up the road in Durham, Mike Krzyzewski's Blue Devils made six Final Fours over seven years. Smith, meanwhile, burned with a cold fire. The North Carolina program was the Paragon program. They all graduated. There was no cheating. Uh, they were articulate, and they won. And then here came Duke, and it was doing all those things, too. By winning NCAA titles in 1991 and 1992, Krzyzewski was one up on Smith. In 1993, when the Tar Heels lacked the flash of previous teams, the coach altered his strategy to fit his material. Here comes the trap. It was not poetry in motion. It was a team that was more 
blue collar. Um, he knew it, and he coached to those strengths. After winning its first ACC regular season title in five years, North Carolina advanced in the NCAA tournament to face Michigan's nationally vaunted Fab Five in the final. Trailing by four with less than five minutes left, the Tar Heels went on a 9-0 tear. With 20 seconds left, they were hanging on ahead by two. And Weber, front court, Carolina thought he traveled with it. Weber, front court, Carolina with foul. He takes a timeout. Technical foul. Timeout. Technical foul. Technical foul on Michigan. The Tar Heels have won the national championship right where they won it 11 years ago. In many ways, that title team was a kind of valedictory for Dean Smith. And when you look back on that team, it's very hard to think of a, of a transcendent star player. I think it was a, a team that vindicated, that expressed what it is that he had taught and believed and hoped for. When they built the Smith Center, they came to him and said, Coach, we want to name this building for you. He said, oh, no, can't we do it for my players? We were paired together in a golf tournament. He could not get from the green to the next tee without just this huge massage of people. Uh, uh, just, they adored him. I've never seen a guy so uncomfortable in that situation. As college basketball mushroomed from regional to national prominence, the private and introverted Smith seemed out of place. Dean Smith kept an awful lot of his life very close to the vest. Just because he was a basketball coach in the spotlight didn't mean that he felt like he had to spill his personal guts. Part of it may be because you never know what people are trying to get from him. You know, you can't control things if you're always giving yourself to people. But if you talk to him long enough, at the end of that conversation, he'll know everything about you and you'll know nothing about him because he deflects the conversation to you. It was always the players. It was always the school. It was always the assistant coaches. The equipment manager, the, 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 you know, the ball boys were more important than what I did. When they built the Smith Center, they came to him and said, Coach, we want to name this building for you. He said, oh, no, can't we do it for my players? They finally decided on the Dean E. Smith Student Activity Center. And to this day, he still calls it the Student Activity Center. He hates to hear anybody call it the Dean Dome. In the mid-1990s, Smith's aversion to public acclaim intensified as he closed in on Adolph Rupp's record of 876 wins. He said, well, I'll tell you this, if I get within one victory of Rupp's record, I will quit because I don't want that record beside my name. It's not my record. It will reflect too much on me and not on my players. I can remember saying, Coach, you know, it may not matter to you, but we all want to say we were part of the winningest coach in college basketball history because we think that much of you and we all would like for you to do that. When he won his 877th game, and all of a sudden, this crowd in the Coliseum started chanting, Dean, Dean, Dean. Dean Smith is the winningest coach in the history of college basketball, 877 career victories. He sprinted to the locker room because he didn't want the acclaim. He was embarrassed about the rough record. I think the day that Bobby Knight gets that record, he'll probably be happy. After breaking the record on March 15, 1997 in the second round of the NCAA tournament, Smith's forces reached the 11th Final Four under his reign. Seven months later, Smith decided that the time had come to step down. Although he wanted to announce his retirement with a simple press release, the world of swarming media wouldn't allow it. That day he couldn't hide, because it wasn't about the players, and he knew it. It was just about him. What loyalty I've had, uh, any man, uh, <laughs> From my players over there. They're really special. That's all. Sure enough, when it's all over, he drives John Thompson to the airport, turns himself into a, a chauffeur, essentially. 
or for somebody else, um, which was a, a fitting way for him to go off into the sunset. Our players like to come back and talk to the old coach, and, and we had play golf together. They're here, and that, that's special. Every major decision that a former player makes in his entire life, regardless if it's 23 years old or 50 years old, he still gets a little more confidence if he checks with Coach Smith and see what Coach Smith says about it. Not a day goes by that I don't, I'm not influenced by what he taught me. Everywhere I go, our program's the envy of everybody because we truly are family. And one of the things that I always thought was really nice was that he would telegram all the players who were playing professionally on the day of their first game, wishing them luck. I knew he was opposed to the war, but when I was in Vietnam, I got letters every week from three people, my mom, my wife, and from Coach Smith. And this is to somebody who contributed very little to that basketball program. In the mid-1980s, when Phil Ford sought treatment for a drinking problem, Smith memorized the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program and attended several meetings with his former star. Ford later became Smith's assistant coach for nine seasons. When you have a disease like that, you know, they're probably uh, you're either going to die or go insane or go to jail. And uh, if you don't get the disease under control, and the fact that I was able to get the disease under control, uh, with him behind me, uh, probably saved my life. A million great players played for Dean Smith. I know that they look at Dean not just as a great coach, but as a great and good man, and that's rare. When his hand-picked successor, Bill Guthridge, retired in 2000, Smith campaigned for former assistant Roy Williams to become the new caretaker of the Tar Heels. But Williams decided to remain at Kansas, and Matt Doherty, a member of Smith's 1982 championship squad, took over. But after three seasons, it became clear that Doherty couldn't walk in his mentor's footsteps. Matt tried to change too much too soon. So I think a lot of the guys who played for four decades suddenly didn't feel like they were a part of the tradition and a part of the family. I think it bothered Coach Smith just the, the fact that, uh, that some of the people were unhappy and he wanted a Carolina basketball family to be together, and I think at that time it probably was splintered. He wanted me to come back. He thought that I could heal some of the wounds. The pressure of saying no to Dean Smith a second time was the ultimate factor in Rory taking the job and coming back to Chapel Hill. And look what's happened to Carolina basketball since. They're singing nothing could be finer than the title for Carolina. The Tar Heels are the national champions of college basketball. Smith won 78% of his games, while 96% of his lettermen graduated. The Kansas boy did it right and did it well, and no one did it better. He served as an example that you could do it the right way and compete for a national championship and do all those things while still maintaining your integrity and high standards of academic excellence. He's cast a very long shadow uh, over the game of basketball. And if basketball had a Mount Rushmore, Dean Smith's face would be on it. Every game you watch, whether it's high school, college, or professional basketball, you see something in that game that Coach Smith was the first one to do. There are coaches out there that have had a positive impact on our sport, but I can't think of one that has done it any better with any more grace or class than him. It's not the Carolina way, it's the right way. He cared about the game, and he made it better.